Hey guys, greetings and salutations. I'm Dan the Wolfman and today I'm going to be talking about MMA weight classes, why we need to add more weight classes, how to combat extreme weight cutting, get rid of this problem, why we need reweigh in limits. I'm going to tell you about the history, about the weight classes and MMA, give you some personal insight. I've been around since the early days and uh, tell you some stories, tell you some of the worst offenses that have happened in MMA that could have been deadly, etc., and so forth, how guys put on so much weight, what the tricks of the trade are, uh, um, all kinds of things, guys. As I said, I'm Dan the Wolfman. If you're not familiar with me, I've been involved in MMA since 1997, beginning in 97, okay? I've been involved in various ways. I go back to, to training, sparring partner with Dan Severn, Tank Abbott, Tito Ortiz, a lot of the old school guys. The first UFC I actually attended live was UFC 12. All right, I now have four black belts. I fought MMA a little bit in the early NHB days, kind of unregulated, different rules with headbutts, knees, kicks to the head on the ground, with wrestling shoes on. All kinds of craziness. I fought two UFC light heavyweight contenders. Uh, I commentated the first live uh, five pancreas events uh, from Japan for UFC Fight Pass. I've worked in MMA media for you know a few years, um, really doing a few, over a couple hundred fighter interviews. So basically, guys, have a listen in. I'm going to fill you with some insight. It'll be worth it. And uh, you know whether you're Ariel Hawani and Chael Sonnen in the media community, whether you're a commissioner out there, whether you're Dana White and Scott Coker, have a listen. Let's all get together and let's see how we can kind of clean things up for the better so these aren't these missed weight and drop fights, but kind of balance out the weight classes, not too strict, not... Um, not strict enough, uh, how we weigh in limits, what I have proposed this for years. People weren't listening, now they're finally kind of listening, so let's go over it. Um, uh, new weight classes, ABC and KSAC kind of started talking about this, proving this a couple years ago, and then more so a year and a half ago. Originally, in boxing, guys, Queensbury rules was eight weight classes. That became 17, that's maybe too much. Um, but anyway, it's 17 now. MMA was no weight classes, then it was three weight classes, then it was five. I have personal history involved in that, I'll get to that in a minute. Now it's eight, it needs to be bumped up to ten, they've approved eleven, but really one's not needed. It should be bumped up to ten weight classes. And um, before we get into that, let's go into some of the worst offenses and why this is necessary. I used to be big on the MMA forums. Some of this got noticed back in the day by UFC and whatnot, by, uh, by uh, let's say, a person in power that gave me dirty looks, didn't want, you know, I'm saying someone's going to die, someone's going to die, like, we need to at least know how much they weigh by fight time. Why don't we weigh them before, well, before they walk into the octagon or other cage, other organizations as well, why don't we weigh them in at fight time for a year and track it? So we see the extreme weight cutters, the top 10 or 15 percent. We see how huge it is and what the differentials are and how that's dangerous. Let's look at that. Dangerous for the fighter getting hit. Dangerous for the guy who's going to get kidney failure. It's not like there hasn't been deaths in MMA. They've just been in smaller orgs or in shooter Brazil, etc. and so forth. I believe about eight now, um, but I'm not positive on that. Going back to, to Dredge, uh, Douglas Dredge, I believe, uh, dying in the Ukraine. And it was a five punches from out. Didn't even look that serious, but you know, pre-existing medical conditions, etc. But there has been some from weight cutting, um, from kidney failure. Um, so some some big examples. Uh, back back in UFC, Anthony Johnson, who was probably likely two or three, if not heavier, by fight time for a welterweight 170 pound fight versus Yoshida, who I'm guessing like most Japanese back then, were only cutting three or four pounds. Okay. Um, so it was like 193 versus maybe 173. And that got a KO in 41 seconds. That's potentially deadly in my opinion when you got a guy like Anthony Johnson, who quite frankly has, you know, broken Arlovsky's jaw at heavyweight. Okay. Uh, and Bellator, M. Pumbu was the champion, non title fight, 198 pounds, I believe, at fight time. Just going by memory. Versus Travis View or Wolf, however you want to say his name. It's probably View, but. I'm not sure, Travis. Anyway, uh, I think it was 244, maybe 248. I think it was 244 by fight time. And it's talked about how cutting 45 pounds to get the, down to the 206 pound, 205 plus one pound allowance weight class uh, was. This is how dangerous it was. At middleweight, we've had Ronnie Marks, uh, nice guy, I've trained with him, great guy, uh, weighing in at 218. 
Okay, now he still cuts 40 pounds last uh, a couple days ago in PFL. Uh, you know, still the, his opponent talking, oh, he, you know, probably cut 40 pounds to fight at light heavyweight. Um, uh, Joe Riggs, 170, was back to 203 for a UFC fight. So you see why this is an issue to the guys getting traumatic brain injury, KOs, and why it's an issue for the weight cutting. And honestly, for the fans, guys gas out in the second, third round, you know, second round before they get their, their second win. Um, the, the, the punch output, the strike output's not going to be as much. The, the fighting output's not going to be as much. This is better for promoters, too, because you can make a couple more champions and uh, less dropouts of fights, less headaches, and uh, better fight performance. We've seen that with a lot of guys that have moved up weight class. Most of them have been very successful. More fight of the night finishes. They have more output, etc., and so forth. Okay, so anyway, what we really need to do is add two weight classes and change one of them. Uh, ABC approved 165 pounds super lightweight. 175 pounds super welterweight. I think that's ridiculous. You don't need to call it super duper. Just change welterweight from 170 to 175. Add in 195 super middleweight. They said 225 cruiserweight, but really that's not needed. You could get, get Stipe at 241, 242, cutting at 225, DC, etc. It's not needed. They can compete just fine against heavyweight fighters when you're weighing like 240, 245. You don't need to cut uh, to 225. Okay. Uh, going back to the weight classes, guys, a little bit of history. MMA started with no weight classes, obviously. It started kind of adding him in 170, 200, and heavyweight. UFC 12, I believe. Uh, eventually, they did 150. I believe it was actually 150 before 55, Jens Pulver fight. Uh, but it wasn't a title yet. It wasn't official. I actually got a call from uh, UFC matchmaker Joe Silva right before, really, the, mo the, the, the first modern weight classes, five weight classes, was adopted. I had been pushing on uh, the underground uh, where I was pretty popular, I got a lot of attention back in the day. Got a huge thread going how we need to add 55 and 85. And I got a call, uh, this is just before I think UFC 28 in New Jersey happened. So New Jersey was kind of already having some of this on the books, but UFC kind of was starting to play with it and wasn't totally in tow yet. Uh, we talked mostly UFC because at least back then, even now, it, you know, it, it is the forefront. Um, well, they, they had already kind of been doing 55 after that first 50 fight. And um, anyway, I get a call from Joe Silva. He goes, you know, hey, what do you think? I like all this. A little bit of information. I talked about it in a recent, a uh, couple years ago, Tito Ortiz uh, interview I did, who I used to train with Tito, of course. Um, how that was really Tito weight. Nobody, nobody knows this, really. Still nobody knows this. 200 was bumped. He said, Joe Silva's like, yeah, but we're going to bump 200 to 205. That's okay because I, because I asked Tito, we asked Tito, and Tito was the moneymaker. We asked Tito, what is the best weight for you? And Tito said 205. So 205 weight class, instead of everything else being a 10 or 15 pound jump, that big 20 pound gap that it became, which is too ridiculous now, you see like, like uh, Romero, uh, you know, it's, it's too big a gap. You got guys that really don't belong there. They're way too heavy, um, not making weight, and they're obviously, like, just ridiculously yoked and, and, and heavier and stronger by fight time because that 20-pound gap too much was for Tito weight. That's okay. We can fix that now by adding in 165, super lightweight, bumping 170 to 175. I don't know if you got to call it super. And... Uh, uh, adding in 195 super middleweight. I don't think 225 cruiserweight is necessary. I, I don't think UFC is going to want that. I know Joe Silva in the past definitely didn't want that. I know he didn't want super heavyweight, even though technically there was one or possibly two super heavyweight fights in UFC, technically. Um, you know, I know Joe Silva definitely didn't want that kind of thing. So, um, uh, guys, just talking male weight classes, 125, 35, 45, 55, 65, 170 gets bumped to 175, 185, 195, 205 in heavyweight. Now, what I've proposed for a long time, this is going back about five, six, seven years, I'm like, this and these issues, we need to, can you, UFC and other promotions, will you at least weigh guys in 
What's it take? Get on a scale before you get in the cage and let's track it. They haven't tracked it. They haven't tracked it. That's been dangerous. Uh, and, and, and so then now you got commission saying 10%. Really, it should be 11 or 12%. Probably 11%. That's what I've been proposing for a long time. Do the math. Uh, not going into the women lower weight classes right now, 105, uh, 115. Let's just look 125 to heavyweight. Let's look at, uh, and I didn't even do the heavyweight calculation. Uh, you know, maybe that's important for Brock Lesnar, but uh, everyone else pretty much doesn't fit in there. 11% reweigh in limit. Okay, so we can, you know, if Dana and, and other people want to get rid of the early weigh ins, I'm actually okay with that as long as we put reweigh in limits. Okay, um, you know, and one, one, one FC one uh, has done uh, pretty good things to combat weight cutting, but you had to bump all everybody up and call guys like Ben Askren who walk around a little kind of chubby looking, uh, you know, a middleweight champion that that really you know can only compete with one seventy Walter weights and, and other works. Um, but the thing to do is an eleven percent reweigh and limit. Um, certain people I've spoken out about, certain commissions want to do 10%, but that's just because it's a round number. They didn't really do the math and take the time to think about it. And they don't have the experience that I have being involved in MMA for 21 years um, to kind of know where most people are cutting and then know the, where the extreme outliers are. So 11% and, and, and doesn't change with one pound allowance. That's a good thing for promoters where you have to look at the one pound allowance as more the fighters would need to look at it more as like the allowance and miss weight less. You don't want to change it with the one pound allowance. So you do it with what uh, the titles are set at, the even numbers, 125, 135, etc. So 125, 11%, 100, you know, 1, 111% of that, or times 1.11, is 138.75. It looks like we got a little sun glare there. Let's see if I can change that. 138.75. 135 would be 149.85. 145 would be 160.95 by fight time. I'm acceptable with that. I'm okay with that. I know that gets rid of the 10, 12% outliers are going to have to bump up, maybe even more. You don't want it to be too much as a promoter, which actually 10% would do. People don't realize what, how much 125 or 150, 155 ers cut. A crazy amount. 170 years pounders cut. A crazy amount, okay, guys. So promoters don't necessarily really even want that. Eleven to ten percent doesn't seem like much, but it is, okay. It really is uh, when you know what most people actually weigh and walk around at. One fifty-five goes up to one seventy-two point oh five. One sixty-five goes to one eighty-three point one five. That's where guys like Connor, Khabib, Nate Diaz, Kevin Lee, they all actually belong in a new 165-pound weight class. That is really where they would all belong. Any of the top probably seven ranked guys at 155, trust me, even with 11%, they really would have to bump up to 165. 170, let's talk about this. You get some kind of where, where guys have been historically. 170 would go up to 188.7. If it was 12%, it would be 190.4. So 188.7, 11% reweigh-in. What that does is allow the top guys to not put on too much muscle mass, to not power lift, to keep their output high. Again, good for viewers, good for fans, good for promoters, more action fights. That's what we want. Um, basically, you know, if he's to believe, GSP was always like 184 to 187, I think, by fight time. Till, recently, at 194, even before the fight, just after re you know, rehydrating a bit. Till 194 recently, they made him drop back down, and I think 190. Um, you know, a guy like Till would probably have to go up. Joe Riggs was once 203 for a UFC welterweight fight. Um, Woodley would obviously have to go up. Maybe one, possibly even two weight classes. Okay? Um, GSP would have to moderate, and all these athletes would have to moderate their uh, powerlifting, uh, their supplements, let's call it. Uh, Etc. and so forth. We'll get to that in a minute. What's really going on? What's going on for a long time? 175 would have to go up, would go 11%, would go to 194.25. If you only did 10%, most guys couldn't even make that. 
They'd be jumping up to light heavyweight. It's ridiculous. So, like, even though that's what commissioners want to do, 11% is really kind of the sweet spot. Maybe even 12, but then light heavyweight gets a little weird. Middleweight, light heavyweight gets a little weird, where really they can be competitive against heavyweights. So 11% is kind of the, the sweet spot. 11.5%, maybe even. Um... 185 would go up to, okay, so 175 would go up to 194.25. That would cover most current welterweights, okay, would be in that new welterweight or super welterweight. Woodley would go up till, probably would go up, maybe he'd try to go there, probably end up missing it a couple times within two years and have to get forced to bump up. I'll get to that in a minute. 185 would go up to 205.35. That's fine, but guess what? Most guys have gone way over that. Uh, I'll just say Ronnie Marsh, I'm not bagging on him, it's just because it was announced during the UFC broadcast. He was back up to 218 by fight time. That's extreme. That's extreme, you know, and, and even a same prior team was one of the guys who died um, cutting weight for a shoot of Brazil. So, you know, we have to protect the athletes from themselves trying to gain too much of an advantage and from hitting another guy that didn't cut so much weight. Um, you know, we weight cutting, the rehydration of the brain, we have to protect the fighters, guys. And it makes for more exciting fights anyway. Uh, 195 go to 216.45 at 11%. At 12%, it would be 218.4, but that's kind of questionable to me for a 195 home weight class because we can, we, we see, um, you know, we see guys fighting at 218 that can compete naturally without cutting weight at heavyweight just fine, okay. Um, you know, so King Mo, King Mo has done that. At weighs in at two eighteen, fights at heavyweight, has done just fine both in Bellator and in Ryzen. Okay, two hundred five go up to two twenty seven point five five. This is puts John Jones before he, he busted the last couple times before he got into powerlifting. Um, Jones and Gustafson would be really right at the limit, right at the limit. And honestly, DC would probably go up. Or, you know, he's got to really, really die. Uh, Travis View, uh, Bader would be right at the limit, I believe. Travis View, Travis View is, was 250, 248, cutting down to 205. So even Travis, Travis View or Wolf, I'm not sure how you say it. I think it's, I think it's Wolf. I don't know. He was, he was cutting 45 pounds, okay? And he shouldn't be fighting a 198 pounder and they cut nothing. So this this is why this is so important, guys. You gotta you gotta listen uh, here, and, and guys take this into consideration. So at twelve percent, it'd be two two twenty nine point six. That's possibly just a little bit too much, because you know really that's a two thirty. Two thirty should be able to compete at heavyweight, in my opinion. So so Jones frame wise, Gustafson uh, Gustafson Gustafson uh, frame wise, th that's really kind of the upper limit. Guy with so much muscle and bass, like Bader, upper limit. DC, eh, maybe DC really should be a heavyweight. I mean, who knows? If DC can beat uh, beat Stipe and then make millions of dollars, possibly beat Brock Lesnar, what does that say about DC? And then, looking back, what does that say about John Jones? John Jones really the GOAT then. You know, really, he probably is, but then you take away, and guys go, well, the steroids. Well, guess what, guys? Everyone's on steroids. Everyone's on steroids. Everyone's on steroids. Okay? Speaking of which, we have a little hint into that from, do your own research, to a, let's say, a longtime UFC champion, recently mentioned 24-hour testosterone. That means testosterone suspension. So there's someone in the know, and let's just say I've heard from people in those very same locker rooms and that have been in training camps. Guys shooting 24-hour testosterone suspension into their legs right after weigh-ins. This is not something new. And so when someone um, of esteem that says that, besides myself, you should pay attention to it. So even guys that were cycling and getting away with, with stuff, cycling and going off and, and designer drugs and everything else that's going on, um, they put on a lot of water weight, a lot of wa water retention, a lot of size with testosterone suspension. One shot, boom, right after weigh-ins. That's why re-weigh-in limits are so important. Okay, and that's one reason. Um, because if you take a testosterone suspension shot, 
and you do your Pedialyte, you've done an extreme weight cut, and you add a little creatine possibly depending on how much it gives you the shits or if you're willing to shit yourself like many people have in fights. Not mentioning any names. Um, you, you put on a lot of weight and you know how much you should put on obviously like because 11% is kind of the sweet spot for me. But guys are putting on, the, the, the outlier guys are putting on like 15%. So the Tills, almost. The Woodleys, the DCs. The the, 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 the the Anthony Johnsons, for sure. I mean, Anthony Johnson versus Yoshida. Look at that 41-second KO. Look at the size of the guys at fight time and tell me that wasn't potentially deadly. Um, and yet, organizations didn't even want to track for a year like I suggested years ago on the underground. Let's track it. And when the head of regulatory affairs gives me a dirty look and definitely saw the post when I see them at an event, you know, it makes you wonder. It makes you wonder, what what are we really looking at? But promoters, it's in your best interest for more exciting fights anyway. We've gotten that. More fight of the night bonuses when guys like Cerrone moved up and all these guys moved up. Okay, I used to train with Spencer Fisher. Spencer Fisher walked sometimes at the size 194 before cutting to 55. Um, uh, let's talk another huge, oh, I can't think of the name right now. Oh, I can't think of the name of Brazilian fighter at 55. Okay, he was cutting from like 194. Guys, he was probably 188 to 194 by fight time for 55 fights. Look at his career, all these decision wins. Guys weren't taking him down. Strength definitely does help. Technique matters, but strength, size definitely matters. Okay, guys, he would win two rounds in the UFC and take the third round off and win all these decisions. Why? Because he's... Cutting so much weight, guys. That's the outliers that need to be bumped up. Okay, so this definitely needs to change. Okay, so what do we do to get rid of the weight cutting? We put in reweight limits, we add to weight classes, and we put in penalties for missed weight. Pretty simple here, guys. You can make it a little more extreme or how much the weight, make this a variable thing, but even just say, hey, 20% of your show money and either 40 or 50%, either 40 or 50% of your win bonus on top of that. So 20% of your show money plus 40 to 50% of whatever your win bonus is should go to the fighter. So if you got a Mackenzie Dern thing where you purposely almost miss weight to gain an advantage to get that win because the win matters more and you're willing to even give up your purse, well let's at least punish you and the poor person you just knocked down and caused brain damage to. Let's at least give them some cheddar for uh, what was allowed. But let's not allow it all the time. If you miss weight twice in a two-year period, in an exactly 24-month period, 365 times two, if you miss weight twice in that period, automatically bumped up. I think that's the right amount because a lot of champions only fight once a year. I think fighters should be fighting three times a year. Always. You know, you know, besides a huge major injury like ACL tears, I think that's what you should be doing. But anyway, you guys have been around the sport for 21 years. That's some of my insights. Uh, Chael Sonnen, Ariel Hawani, Dana White, Scott Coker, Athletic Commissions. I hope you're all listening. I hope you guys look at the math. 10% is a little too little. 12% maybe it could be acceptable. Maybe it's a little bit too much. 11, 11.5%. That's really kind of the sweet spot. Um, Reweigh li weight and limits. Don't change that with one pound allowance. That forces fighters to, because if they play with that one pound allowance now and plus the 11%, they're gonna, a lot of them are going to be just over because they're trying to get so much advantage. So this kind of would um, lead to less uh, missed weights. Okay, And the missed weight thing is whether the weigh in or the re weigh in. When I talk about the penalties, Okay, so whether you make, I don't care if you make the weight, if you miss the reweigh limit by, by a pound, I don't care. You're, you're over, you're obviously someone that, you know, needs to be looked at bumping up. And if you miss twice in that two-year period, you, you're, you need to be forced to bump up by both the commissions and the organizations. Um, so time to add 165, time to add 175. You know, bumps 170 to 175. Time to add 195. That 20 pound Tito weight disparity you've known for a long time is too big. Okay, so guys like Rockhold and Romero and Machida, boy, they fit perfectly 195.
Okay, they might cut it at 205. But frame-wise, they kind of need to do too much stuff to even be competitive against champions at 205. Because the 205 guys are walking around right now. They're back to, I mean, honestly, between 228, John Jones, and DC is probably 234. Maybe 236. Cutting from 236, probably back up to 233, 234 by fight time. So, it's you know, we need these limits, guys. I hope you enjoyed this. Some insight. And that's it. You know, tweet at me at Dan the Wolfman. Uh, hit me up on Facebook. Let me know what you think. And um, anyway, kaboom. Go to uh, thecombatsystem.com, focusdojomma.com, see me sparring 30 top fighters in the world.